Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Filippi Sands, who is Professor of International Law at the College of Law, London, and Director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals at that campus. His publications include Lawless World and Torture Team, uh, Rumsfeld's Memo and the Betrayal of American Values. I want to show you that book. Uh, and of course, he is a barrister in England who has written uh, quite a bit on international law and who practices before uh, many, if not most, of the international tribunals. Filippi, welcome to Berkeley. Terrific to be with you, Harry. What do you see as, as defining the, the path that you took? I think what happened was not so much that my family members exposed me to this particular area. I mean, there's been no lawyers in my family. I'm the first. My mother didn't go to university. My dad's a dentist. No interest really in the political world. But I grew up in a household which was touched by foreignness. Mm. And so I was always interested in things that were international. So I, I, at school, uh, I had a big interest. I had a couple of teachers who had a profound uh, influence. If you ask me you know, what was the single moment I remember in my childhood at school, it would be an economics teacher that we had mm. uh, by the name of Ed Burke, ironically enough, who took us down a coal mine when we were 14-year-olds. Mm. And that was, a, you know, being a sort of North London middle-class boy, a pretty powerful experience. And then when I went up to university. And where did you go? I went to Cambridge. Uh, I was 18. In England, law is an undergraduate course. I actually started off doing economics. Uh, I loved economics. I'd had this wonderful economics teacher. But at first year of university doing economics, it turned out that my teacher at school had prepared us and there was going to be nothing new. And I switched to law, which I regret. But in my second year, I was exposed for the first time to international law and I sort of fell in love with the subject. We had a wonderful teacher, a Yorkshireman by the name of Robbie Jennings. I remember him standing up in October uh, 1980 to the whole class from 300 of us and saying, well, I'm going to teach you for the next year about international law and probably out of the 300 of you, if one of you ever has an issue of international law in your working life, that would be a decent mm -hmm. result. Let's go back and talk a little about being an international lawyer. Uh, what, are, what are the skills involved? I mean, in this earlier period, there wasn't a lot of law there, right? Or is that a yeah. fair? When I studied international law, there was basically one court, the International Court of Justice. As I mentioned, we had a teacher who basically said, this you may find interesting, but it's going to be of limited practical relevance. Um, and I sort of fell into it all by hmm. accident. I studied in Cambridge. I loved international law. I stayed on. I did a master's in international law so I could specialize in it for a year. At the time I had an American girlfriend uh, who was doing a sort of an MD, PhD program, a Marshall Scholar mm -hmm. uh, in Cambridge. Then she went back to Harvard uh, and I followed her. Uh, I had no job, no position, no nothing. Uh, I just went to hang out with her in Cambridge <laughs> Mass. Literally it happened mm -hmm. like that. And I needed some money and I needed to live. And so I got a job as a research assistant to a young academic in international law at Harvard Law School, a guy called David Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, and um, was his research assistant for a year and was a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School for a year. And that, that, that was a big experience. It introduced me to the American way of lawyering, the American way of being at law school. And after, you know, in a sense, the dullness of Cambridge where we were taught that law and politics are two separate things. Here, all of a sudden, I was exposed to the world of critical legal studies and all the battles that were going on at Harvard Law School then, and it was a fascinating year. Was it important to, to understand international law in the context of international politics? Well, we studied international law in Cambridge, England, in a context in which, let's put it this way, we were not encouraged to find the links mm -hmm. between politics and law. Uh, and uh, then I went to spend a year in America, and it was the very opposite. You could not divorce law and politics. Law was so deeply connected mm -hmm. to political process that one had to look at them 
you know, as part, you know, flip sides of the same coin, so to speak. And that encouraged me to look at law in a much more policy-oriented way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was an important development. I think if I hadn't spent that year in America, I would have followed a very different path. And then while I was there, I received a request um, from Cambridge in England to apply for a research fellowship at one of the colleges uh, in Cambridge, St. Catherine's College, uh, to spend initially a year being a research fellow studying aspects of international law. I applied, I got it, I ended up spending four years there uh, and became an international lawyer. And while I was doing that, I'd always been quite interested also in the practical side of things, so I qualified as a lawyer. I didn't know if I'd get a teaching job. It had never occurred to me to look for a teaching job, mm -hmm. and I thought I was going to be a practicing lawyer, so I qualified also as a barrister. So I've always had these two strands. I've always taught and practiced. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, what, what would you say are the skills that are required to do international law well if students are watching this? I think you need, I, I think the most important ability is the ability to disconnect yourself from your own milieu and mm -hmm. understand how other cultures and other societies and other political persuasions think of the issues you are interested. Try to put yourself in the position of the other to see how they will react to the same facts or circumstances, but they may do so in a different way. And that, I think, for me, is the lesson that I've always learned. It, whether I'm in a classroom being asked a question by a Colombian student, I'm trying to understand where she or he is coming from. When I appear before the International Court of Justice and I'm making an argument to a bench of 15 international judges, I'm scanning the bench, looking at the 15 different nationalities, mm -hmm. appreciating that they all come with their own emotional, intellectual, political baggage, it's culturally specific, and trying to understand how they come to the same set of problems we're all looking at, because we all come to these problems with our own baggage. And, and international law is about taking the law to a higher level than one might find in one particular national setting? International law classically is defined as the law that governs relations between states. It's evolved since then. It, it also governs relations uh, between states and individuals, between states and corporations, involving international organizations, the OECD, the UN and other bodies. But essentially, it's the law that binds the globe. And it has a role at the international level, but it also, in many countries, not so much in the United States, also has a role at the domestic level. So in the English courts now, very frequently in my cases, I will argue international law before the domestic courts. And the English courts now are taking international law arguments pretty seriously. In, in the lawless world, you, you trace uh, uh, the, this, this new age of international law all the way back to Roosevelt and, and Churchill and the Atlantic Charter. Talk, talk a little about that, because it's, it's really about their concern about the individual, about security, but also uh, the, the, the consolidation worldwide of British American values. Yeah, you know, the Atlantic Charter is a pretty remarkable document. I, when I was researching Lawless World, I was trying to understand in writing that book how it was that President Bush and Prime Minister Blair could have got so many things so wrong in terms of their engagement with the rule of law internationally. So I went back historically. I wanted to understand what was the engagement of these two countries going back in time. And I came across, I'd been dimly aware of it, but I came across and looked at much more carefully the Atlantic Charter. And it's a a really remarkable document. August 1941, the United States is not yet involved in the war. Britain is deeply enmeshed. What happens? The British Prime Minister, the American President, meet off the coast of Newfoundland, and they decide to agree a one-page set of principles, very few, small number of principles, on remaking the world after the Nazis have been vanquished and to take on the communist threat. And it's basically three foundational pillars under an umbrella labeled the rule of law. Pillar number one, no use of force in international relations except in exceptional circumstances. Pillar number two, global economic liberalization, free trade, intellectual property rights, foreign investment protection. Pillar number three, dignity of the human individual, self-determination, fundamental human rights. And you find in that document the roots mm -hmm. of the remarkable period in the 1940s when our modern 
international architecture was put in place. Free trade rules, Nuremberg Charter, global agreement on tariffs and trade, Breton Woods, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Genocide Convention, it is all there. And, and it, this, this path of history that followed was uh, really about building the stepping stones, but also in different contexts seeing the need for a body of international law and of institutions uh, to, to realize this vision that you just talked about. I think Roosevelt and Churchill each had different objectives. I mean, part of Roosevelt's objective was to, shall we say, wean Britain off of its Commonwealth. But what they shared was a vision of a new world which would be under an umbrella of rules. It wasn't altruism at play. I mean, they were promoting their own interests and their own values, which of course is very ironical when we now look at the uh, ways in which President Bush's administration has sought to trash the system of international rules as being undermining of US sovereignty and power. I, I think the opposite is true. I mean, I think the United States' preeminence is largely built on the vision that President Roosevelt enshrined in norms of law in the 1940s with the support then uh, of Truman and then of Eisenhower and subsequent presidents. If you look at the global economic rules they've created, the framework for prosperity and wealth in the United States, if you look at the norms on the use of force, they've provided the context of a different world order. And then most fundamentally, the norms on the dignity of the human individual essentially, essentially, is the export of American constitutional values. That's what Eleanor Roosevelt wanted to do in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. She didn't, you know, she wasn't apologetic about that. The, the, the extent to which globalization furthered this uh, interest uh, on the American side uh, uh, toward international law, and, and here, business interests, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the WTO and other efforts to, to create a body of law so that there could be rules about intellectual property, about trade, and so on, is a, is a kind of a, a, uh, an important uh, part of the ascent right before the fall. Uh, absolutely. It was a visionary uh, image and a recognition that in order to promote its values and in order to prosper, the United States needed a rules-based uh, system. So, so the idea, 40 or 50 years on, let's say, moving to the Bush administration, that rules undermine the United States mm -hmm. is actually a nonsense. It, it turns out that the prosperity economically of the United States, which has been built on free trade rules, foreign investment protection rules, intellectual property rules, many other rules with an economic objective, lies at the heart of the United States' remarkable ability um, to export economic intellectual ideas and develop its own uh, economic well-being. Imagine for a moment you take away all of those rules. Mm -hmm. You take away the trade rules, you take away the intellectual property rules, you take away the foreign investment protection rules. The United States collapses. The United States is built on a system of international rules. Uh, and if people say the United States is against international rules or the President Bush is against international rules, that's not right. What President Bush has done in the past is essentially say there is good international law, the economic stuff, and then there's the bad international mm. law, the non-economic stuff, and we're going to get rid of the bad international law. Uh, you talk in Lawless World, uh, uh, and you were uh, very prescient with regard to the implications of what Bush was yet to do, you know, in, in, and was in the process of doing in, in a way uh, that I don't think we were at home as much, and this must come from your focus on international law. How do you account for this neoconservative agenda uh, 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 as being so, uh, having such animus? against the whole body of international law and of, of going it alone. Is it, a, is it what Schumpeter would call an atavism? That is, the, the, with the bipolar world gone, uh, it, it was a national security atavism, namely, we will now rule the world? It's a very good question, and it's a very complex question that I don't think I can do justice in, in the limited amount of time. I think it's a complex question. Uh, and the answer to that question is built on deep theory and 
individual fear. Um, d deep theory, for example, a concern, which I think is a legitimate concern that the neocons articulate about the democratic values of international law. Uh, I think it's entirely legitimate for the neocons to have put on the table a question as to how international law is made, how it binds states, how it's effective at the domestic level. And so there is a concern with democratic theory. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's also a concern about personal well-being. So we know, for example, from various accounts that have been written, that when Donald Rumsfeld came back to the Department of Defense, he initiated uh, a review of various international norms, which, for example, had caused Senator Pinochet to be arrested and which made it difficult for people like Henry Kissinger to travel abroad because of fears of war crimes, uh, investigations, or the tap on the shoulder, which might lead to arrest. And uh, Donald Rumsfeld, in particular, I think, was not motivated by high theory in terms of democratic values or anything mm. else. He saw norms of international law as undermining the ability of the United States to exercise his choice, to exercise choices in particular directions, and he wished to remove from the equation such norms of international law which would impose constraints. Constraints on the use of force, constraints on foreign travel, constraints on the promotion of particular values. And so it was a sort of a la carte multilateralism. You pick and choose the bits of international law you like, and you get rid of the other ones. But I don't think there's a simple singular answer to your question. I think different people were motivated by very different considerations. What they were joined with was somehow a belief that the very nature of international law, the very nature of international norms, was inconsistent with core American values. Core American values of democracy, core American values of individual freedom. I think that's wrong, uh, and I think in fact it's the very opposite of the case, that international law such as it is encapsulates core American values, and I think the pendulum will now swing back the other way. It's interesting, and uh, at the end of the book, and we're going to talk about your book on the Rumsfeld Memo in a minute, uh, you quote somebody, and I have the quote here somewhere, but, but namely that, that these lawyers that you're looking at, uh, and I'll walk you through the scenario in a few minutes, uh, were, were obsessed with a vision of unitary uh, uh, presidential power, and and you just suggested that in in a, in a lot of of uh, what across the board seems to be present is a a marshalling of power, uh, a a a felt threat uh, from checks and balances domestically, and the same seems to be true in international law. Talk a little about that, because it was a, it was a form, a narrow vision uh, of what leadership involved, and it, 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 ma it involved a maximum ability to act without constraint. Well, it's about power at yeah. the end of the day, yeah. and uh, external constraints on the exercise of power. What it basically boils down to, if you like, if one articulates it in a simple image, John Yu's view, a professor at Berkeley Law School, apparently articulated uh, to Alberto Mora, the general counsel of the Navy, and I think to others, that if the President of the United States wishes to engage in acts of torture, there is no rule of international law or domestic constitutional law that can stop him from doing that. Um, and it articulates a vision in which the Commander-in-Chief, in times of national emergency or national security, is not constrained either by the Constitution or through the Constitution any norms of international law. Now, the difficulty with that, of course, is we know where that leads. Mm -hmm. If that is the case in relation to the President of the United States, why isn't it the case also in relation to the President of Iran or the President of Egypt or the President of Syria or in the past to leaders of the Soviet Union or leaders of Nazi Germany? It articulates a vision of power unfettered of power unconstrained, that leads to a very dangerous place. On the other hand, coming back to a point I made earlier, there is a concern of understanding what is the democratic legitimacy and constitutionality of norms arising outside of a domestic legal order. So there's a difficult balancing exercise, but the bottom line of it is, to put my cards on the table, mm -hmm. international law is sufficiently well developed to say there are certain norms which are peremptory and intransgressible 
in any circumstances in relation to the dignity of the human individual, the dignity of any person who happens to be detained. And there is no system of national law which can override those norms. And that's a system which essentially articulates the very vision of the United States Constitution that motivated FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt mm. and others to promote the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, an important turning point, I think, in, 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 in your perspective is the uh, serving of a warrant on Pinochet uh, when he was in London, because this, this implied that there was a, a way to act when there was a perceived uh, threat uh, 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 emerging from somebody who had violated the norms and was bound uh, by, by treaty uh, to not torture, to not quit war crimes. Talk a little about that, because it's really about the idea of universal uh, jurisdiction, and it's what you just alluded to when you were talking about Rumsfeld thinking about Kissinger traveling because of his involvement in the Chilean uh, and, and Rumsfeld Rumsfeld's view is, was based on, on, on the Pinochet case. I think it's very hard to overstate the significance of Pinochet. Mm -hmm. It was the very first time that a national court like the English courts was faced with the question, does it have jurisdiction over an individual who happened to have been a former president who is alleged to have committed mm -hmm. an international crime? And the English courts struggled over that question and eventually they concluded that when a treaty has been adopted and binds all relevant states, which establishes the notion of an international crime and imposes an obligation to prosecute or extradite, in those circumstances there cannot be immunity. That's very problematic for those who uh, promote the idea of unfettered, unconstrained uh, power based on unitary executive theories for the president of any country, because it basically means whatever happens domestically cannot have a an extra uh, jurisdictional consequence. And one of the most striking things as one goes through the various legal memos that were written by lawyers for the Bush administration is they never seem to have turned their minds to that possibility. They never asked themselves mm. the question, okay, we can create legal arguments and conditions in which domestically we can do X, Y, or Z, but what will the context be when we travel outside the jurisdiction? And that, I think, could be described as an example of poor uh, lawyering or it's simply hubris and a failure to recognize that the United States is but one player uh, in an emerging global legal order that was created by the United States. Mm -hmm. uh let me show your book, Torture Team, and then I'm going to walk you through important aspects of it. And, and tell us how, uh, I'm very interested in that creative moment when you decided to pursue this topic. And it, it really starts with a press conference that Alberto Gonzalez held uh, with Jim Haynes, the, the attorney for Rumsfeld in the Pentagon, after Abu Ghraib. Talk about that. I had published Lawless World in 2005, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd written it as a sort of macro picture of the world and its international rules, and I was being asked what was I going to write next. And a number of people who had read Lawless World, so the one chapter in there that they thought contained the nuggets of an interesting story was the chapter on Guantanamo. I dealt with it in Lawless World, but very generally and just on the basis of the document. That conversation, which took place with a number of people in the summer of 2006, coincided, really did coincide, with my coming across an old movie that I'd not seen for mm -hmm. many years, Judgment at Nuremberg. I think I had the flu or something. I was ill, lying in bed, channel surfing. And I come across the opening shots of this remarkable film that tells the story of the prosecution by the US military of some of the worst lawyers in the German Nazi regime. Uh, and it chimed with a concern that I had looking at some of the documents, including the press conference with Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Haynes. How on earth did the US lawyers mm -hmm. authorize techniques of interrogation which on their face were inconsistent with the very international rules the United States more than any other country had put in place, the Geneva Conventions, the Torture Convention. And so what I decided to do was abandon my normal processes, which is to do things on the basis of documents, and I thought, let's go and meet these people. 
Mm -hmm. I want to go meet these people. I want to talk to them. I want to hear their stories. I'll try to do it with an open mind. I'd like to see what motivated them. I'd like to see what the true story is. And I decided to adopt a different methodology. I'd write to them. I'd track them down. I'd see if they'd speak to me. And basically, most everybody did, did, did agree to speak to me. And, and we should explain to our audience, of course, they, they need to go out and buy the book and, and read it themselves because we can't do justice to it in an hour. But, but it, it's really what, what you, you had uh, evidence of uh, apparent torture uh, uh, revealed in Abu Ghraib uh, and uh, uh, coming out of Guantanamo. And, and you, you saw immediately, hey, if, if they were doing this, you know, this violates uh, the Geneva Conventions, the Torture Treaty, and so on. And then I, I want to emphasize what you just said, which is a big part of your formative experience is having come to America and learned about American law and the role that America plays. So you are, you are really an establishment figure who is sort of looking Looking at this, and not not a, as a as a far lefty who thinks that everything that America does is well, wrong. In, you know, in Britain, I'm I'm an establishment figure. I'm a barrister. I'm yeah, a Queen's yeah. Counsel. I teach one of the oldest law schools in in Britain. I'm, you know, part of the British mainstream. I don't think my views are particularly radical or mm. different from mainstream views. I happen to have spent time in America. I happen to be married to an American. Mm -hmm. um, and I happen to be married to an American attorney. And so we would spend in our family time a lot of time talking. Uh, about all of these issues and uh, trying to understand what it was uh, exactly that had happened. And I focused on the lawyers because I know about lawyers. Mm -hmm. I mean, my world is a world of lawyers. I deal with lawyers from literally every country in the world. I've dealt extensively with American lawyers. And as the story the administration provided, a narrative which suggested that the move by the Department of Defense to aggressive techniques of interrogation had come from the bottom up. I smelt a rat, as mm -hmm. we say in London. I smelt that something was not right. I read the transcript of these two senior administration lawyers promoting a particular story, pointing the finger to people down at Guantanamo, pointing the finger to a lawyer down at Guantanamo, uh, the infamous Diane Beaver. And I thought there is something about this story that is not right because they are they are, they are advocating. They are not merely setting out a particular story. They are advocating a particular narrative, and I want to find out if that narrative is true or not. I, 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 I was distrustful of the message I was being sent. Mm -hmm. Now, explain to our audience what the Rumsfeld memo was and uh, 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 and and this becomes what, what is quite interesting about the book is you, you there is a moment in time uh, Rumsfeld signs a memo which his lawyer has prepared uh, and uh, that is a turning point a line is crossed what was in that memo and and. Yeah. Your, 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 your viewers will be pleased to know the document can be obtained on the web and it, is, it has the great merit of being one page long. Mm. So there's not a great deal of reading. So our young audience will definitely want to get All your audience yeah. will be able to get the memo. Um, it was written by Mr. Haynes, who was Mr. Rumsfeld's lawyer, General Counsel of the Department of Defense, on the 27th of November 2002. It was signed by Mr. Rumsfeld a few days later on the 2nd of December 2002. And in the document, Mr. Rumsfeld acceded to Mr. Haynes' recommendation that he give blanket approval for the use at Guantanamo by military interrogators of 15 techniques of interrogation, from shouting to forced nudity to grooming to the use of dogs to stress positions, and that he leave open, but not reject, three other techniques of interrogation, including waterboarding. Mr. Rumsfeld accedes to that recommendation mm -hmm. and he scrawls his signature and below his signature he writes, I stand for eight to ten hours a day, why is standing limited to four hours? And that is a famous scrawl that has given the document a degree of notoriety. What is so striking about that? What your viewers need to understand, that since 1863, since President Lincoln determined that the United States will proceed on the basis that military necessity will never admit of cruelty. There has been no formalized use 
of cruelty. This appears to be the very first time that the line has been crossed of formalizing the use of cruelty in order to protect the interests of the United States. Now, it's not to say there hasn't been cruelty before. Vietnam, in Korea, I'm well aware, in Central America in the 1980s. But what you won't find is a document that is equivalent to this one. And to my way of thinking, it's a very significant change when you institutionalize cruelty, when you formalize it, when you legalize it, when you legitimize it in a piece of paper, which someone as significant as the Secretary of Defense then signs. And so this was an act which took the United States into a different place. And that was what I was interested in exploring. And, and your research leads you to interview the then commander of Guantanamo, the attorney, uh, his attorney at Guantanamo, and work your way up the, the military chain of command, the, the head of uh, 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 the, the Southern Central Command, uh, the, the, uh, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And, and, and what, so, so as you're, you're making this journey, talking to people who, who don't see you as a prying journalist, what, 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 what do you see? What, what, and what shocks you most? Well, it's a wonderful thing about the United States that someone like me, an outsider, can email people, write a letter, call them up and say, look, I'm writing a book about the role of lawyers in the global war on terror. Could I have a conversation with you? And basically, everyone said to me yes. Um, uh, some small number were off the record, most were on the record. <clears throat> I started at the ground in Guantanamo with the combatant commander, Major General Dunleavy, a lawyer, a reserve two-star officer who specialized in intelligence, but who was a judge in Erie, Pennsylvania. I met his lawyer. Diane Beaver, the staff judge advocate. I went up through General Hill, the head of Southern Command. I went up to the number three in the Pentagon, Doug Fyth, who was the head of policy. I met with the chairman of the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Myers. I met with Jim Haynes. I met with a vast number of military lawyers. I met with naval psychologists. I met with the general counsel of the Navy, who played such a key role in bringing this to an end. And from these tales, a truer account, I believe, of what had happened emerged. What were the things that were most central? A small number of things. Firstly, from Doug Fyth, confirmation that the decision to do away with the Geneva Conventions was intended to facilitate abusive interrogation. I learnt that. I learnt, secondly, that contrary to the narrative spun by the administration, when Mr. Haynes wrote his memo, he didn't rely on the legal advice of an inadequately trained lawyer down at Guantanamo, Diane Beaver. He relied on the advice, the opinion written by John Yu and Jay Bybee, which authorized, in effect, a definition of torture which allowed a great number of things to be done that otherwise could not have been done. That was a significant development. I learned, thirdly, that contrary to the narrative spun by the administration. This was not an example of the administration being presented with documents of which it was blissfully unaware, as they've sought to mm. describe. When Mr. Haynes and Mr. Gonzalez stood before the press in June 2004 and tried to douse the flames of Abu Ghraib, they didn't tell the media or the American people that they'd been down to Guantanamo in September mm. 2002, that they had met Diane Beaver, they'd met Mike Dunleavy, they'd watched an interrogation, and they had, on the account of Diane Beaver and Mike Dunleavy, left the folks at Guantanamo with the message, do what needs to be done with Mohammed al Qatani, the 20th hijacker. Now put yourself in a moment in the position of a young uh, type lawyer or a combatant commander getting that message from the most powerful lawyers in the United States. It's a clear message from the top. Uh, and that, I think, was absolutely central because from that fact, I was then able to prise open what I think is closer to the truth than what the administration has spun. Namely, it came from the top down, not from the bottom up. It did not proceed with deliberation and care. It did not proceed in accordance with the rule of law. And later on, of course, what I established was that it had migrated from Guantanamo 
uh, to Abu Ghraib. And since the article that I published in Vanity Fair that summarized part of the book and the book have been published, there have been significant congressional hearings and all of the material that has come out has moved to confirm the account that I have given. It came from the top down. Mm -hmm. and, and throughout this, we, we have, uh, let, let's identify some aspects of this. You, you have a situation where uh, the, the, the deceit is to say that the request comes from down below. They need to do this, and this is the memo that will justify that. But as you work your way up, people in the chain of command, for example, the, the General Hill, uh, were, were aware that they didn't want to sign on this and they pushed it up. Whereas others, like General Myers, basically was essentially snookered. Well, G G General Hill um, mm -hmm. is an interesting man, a very decent man and a man of great intelligence, I thought, uh, who was obviously very concerned. He doesn't actually recommend these techniques in his memo. What he does do, and it, it, I have to say, I, I had missed it even though it's there blindingly obvious yeah. in the document, is he actually asks for Department of Justice sign-off. Yeah. So concerned is he by what is being proposed. I found him deliberative, I found him careful. Uh, that is not uh, characteristics that I uh, have to say I met when I spent uh, a couple of hours or more with General Myers. I was astonished by his lack of understanding of what had been decided on the Geneva Conventions, as you know. The decision was taken by President Bush in February 2002. This is a decision at the heart of the whole story to determine that none of the detainees at Guantanamo could have any rights under, under, under the Geneva Conventions. General Myers hadn't understood that to have been the decision. That was a shocking moment. Uh, I learned from General Myers that he believed each one of the techniques had come straight out of the existing rule book. I pointed out to him that they hadn't. We went through the rule, through the interrogation techniques, one by one, and you could literally see his draw drop as we got to dogs and grooming and removal of clothing and stress positions. And we should say that the military manual had adopted a lot of um, uh, these conventions that we had been talking about earlier. All of this was prohibited by the U.S. Army Field Manual 34 stroke 52, which is premised on interrogations built on, rap built on rapport building and which outlaws any of the techniques that are being used. And it fully complies with and integrates into domestic practice the Geneva Convention. So, you know, the United States has been very, very careful uh, and consistent in giving effect to Geneva. This was a radical departure. To have a chairman of the Joint Chiefs who seemed blissfully unaware of that was, to say the least, very troubling. I mean, in fact, I was so troubled by it. I remember getting home uh, after I'd met General Myers in Washington and saying to my wife, you know, a New Yorker, an American lawyer, you, you are not going to believe the conversation that I had with General Myers. He thought they'd decided to apply Geneva. He thought all these techniques came out of the rule book. She said, ah, he's pulling the wool over your eyes. He's, you know, he's pulled a fast one on you. And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Listen to the tape. It's recorded. I recorded the whole thing. So she listened to the tape. And she said, oh, my word. You're right, that is totally okay. astonishing. It's a sh it was a shocking moment. I mean, you know, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is a pretty powerful, intellectually demanding position. And I got the impression, perhaps I'm wrong, that he was completely out of his depth. Others have subsequently told me that he was there precisely because he was perceived by Mr. Rumsfeld as mm -hmm. being someone who would do what needed to be done. And he certainly did not disabuse me of that notion when I listened again to the recording. Uh, we had Lawrence Wilkerson on our program, and he talked about a cabal of lawyers, basically. Uh, John Yu uh, from Berkeley, who was in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Office of Legal Advice in the Justice Department. Uh, Haynes, who we've talked about, who was a, the Pentagon lawyer, uh, the chief lawyer in the Pentagon under Don Rumsfeld. We had Gonzalez, uh, first at the President Counsel Office and then Attorney General. We had uh, Mr. Yu's supervisor, uh, Bisbee, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, help us understand uh, these lawyers, the role they played, and what was wrong with what they did. Right. I mean, let, let, let's put it down to the basics. A lot of your viewers will have dealt with lawyers. Mm -hmm. They buy and sell a house, they've got to deal with an insurance dispute, they've got to deal with a health claim. 
you go to your lawyer and you say to your lawyer, these are the facts, what options are available to me? And what you expect your lawyer to do is firstly to know the law and secondly to say to you, well, this is what the law requires. I think there's some areas in which we can push a claim in a particular direction, but I'm bound to advise you that at the end of the day, there are the following precedents which limit our ability to make this argument and the following statutes which limit our ability to make that argument. And you expect a degree of independent advice based on functioning critical processes which tell you the law as it is. That didn't happen in this case. Mm -hmm. These lawyers who were joined by a distinct ideology, who plainly were brought in to do a particular job, the legal advices that are given by the individuals that you, may, you name and the processes that they followed are not characterized by an independence of thought. So unhelpful authorities are ignored, mm -hmm. contrary decisions are bypassed and simply not addressed. And what you have is a situation in which the lawyers appear to be simply rubber stamping predetermined executive policies. You know, when you go to your lawyer, you don't expect your lawyer to say to you, well, you tell me what you want to do and I'll mm -hmm. find you a legal argument that justifies mm -hmm. it. That's what happened in this case. They abdicated a legal role and they, in so doing, I think, crossed a line, the line that separates good advice from bad advice, the line that separates bad advice from unprofessional advice, and I think possibly also the line that separates unprofessional advice into advice that gives rise to criminal liability. Let's not forget, Article 4 of the Torture Convention criminalizes complicity and participation in torture. And we have signed that. Uh, the United States is absolutely a party to that convention. A lawyer who adopts an advice that allows torture to occur is an enabler and falls into the frame of the criminal justice system. We don't have the full facts. I think more will emerge. But on the basis of what is out there, it is plain that at the very least the argument can be made that these lawyers crossed a line, manipulated process, manipulated advice, allowed the administration to have a rubber stamping by so-called lawyers acting independently of their desires, and that gives rise to the most serious questions. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, part of this, a big part of the processes of the Bush administration, uh, we talked about a unitary president and the, the elimination of balance of power. They, they, they excluded information that would call into question what they were doing. So, so you have a group throughout your book are professional interrogators, the NCIS uh, and from the FBI. You have lawyers uh, in the various military services, JAGs, who basically know what the rules are, know that this is wrong, know we can't do it, but once these people give a signal that they can see the picture in a, in a, in a broader way, then they are excluded from the, the discussion. That, that happens systematically. Yeah. Anyone who was likely to exercise an independent view that may not be consistent with what the administration wanted was cut out of the process. The senior military lawyers were cut out of the process. The State Department lawyers were cut out of the process. And I can uh, illustrate that very, very simply. When all of these documents, the Rumsfeld Memo, the new techniques of interrogation, the request from Dunleavy, the uh, memorandum from General Hill, made their way up to General Myers, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he passes them on to his lawyer, Jane Dalton. All of this has emerged now in sworn testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee as a result of the book having come out. And what does Jane Dalton testify? She explains how, when she got these documents, she followed the normal processes of getting a full and wide-ranging legal review from the lawyers who knew, from the uniformed senior service lawyers. Shortly after she initiated that policy review, the response... <coughs> The responses started coming in, we don't do this. This looks like it's torture. This is going to expose us to criminal liability. This is not who we are. This is not what the US military does. She passes on these short memoranda to the office of the Secretary of Defense and his general counsel. Very shortly after that, 
she is instructed to stop the review. Mr. Haynes, the lawyer for Mr. Rumsfeld, intervenes to short circuit the decision making process and stop contrary legal opinions from being received. And that's crucial because with that act, any claim to having acted in good faith collapses. A good faith legal advisor is going to want to hear the contrary views. It's going to want to hear the arguments from the lawyers who've been in uh, military service for three, four decades, devoted their lives to this, and actually know something about these rules. The thing about Mr. Haynes and Mr. Yu and Mr. Addington, they don't actually have a competence to advise in this area of the law. It's a particular and specialist area of the law. The importance of advising on it correctly is, of course, that if you give the wrong advice, if you allow the United States to engage uh, in acts on certain people, those people's governments may in turn authorize the same types of acts against the United States. And that was just completely ignored. So you've got a very, very serious uh, situation in which lines were crossed um, and a great deal of damage to the reputation of the military, to the reputation of the United States, and to the prospects for American men and women in military service across the world uh, is significantly endangered by going down this route. To what extent were, was uh, this about power, or was it really uh, self-delusion? And, and what I have in mind here is if, if you look at uh, Professor Yu's theories, he has a, a whole body of writings that, that uh, uh, essentially argue that the Congress can't do anything about what the president wants to do in war. Uh, you, you put in place that this is a war on terrorism, you know, immediately uh, uh, after the action, uh, and uh, uh, that the president is not bound by uh, the Geneva Conventions, which is the contribution of, of Mr. Fife, which he was very impressed uh, with telling you about. Uh, and then finally, you have the ticking bomb scenario. And of course, the ticking bomb scenario suggests that something is going to happen in about an hour, uh, and we need to get the information, as Jack Bauer does on 24. But in fact, here we're talking about interrogating uh, 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 detainees who had been held for a year and really had nothing more to tell us. I identify three sources which led to what happened. Ideology. Mm -hmm. The individuals who were driven in this direction had a particular vision of America's place in the world, of America's unfettered and unconstrained ability to act, and a particular ideological approach to the interpretation of the Constitution. That's the first thing. The second thing it was about incompetence. Mm -hmm. The people who were advising on these areas of the law actually have no background. Uh, in this area of the law and gave shoddy, ill thought out and incompetent advice. And thirdly, it's about hubris. It's not listening to others who may have a better understanding. And the consequence of all this is that of course it's taken us to a seriously bad place. I mean, on the issue of torture, there are a number of arguments to be marshaled that the administration presumably would have been told, were told, I know for a fact they were told. One, we don't do torture because it's not who we are. We just don't do it. We don't do cruelty. President Lincoln, 1863. Two, we don't do torture because it doesn't work. Interrogator after interrogator after interrogator explained to me that actually interrogation of al a year after he's been caught in the circumstances in which he found himself was a useless exercise. And as I describe in the book, it didn't actually produce, after 54 days of abusive interrogation amounting to torture, any meaningful intelligence. Thirdly, it undermines our ability to work with our allies. Mm -hmm. Allies are not going to hand over detainees to countries that engage in abusive techniques of interrogation. And fourthly, and I think equally significantly, it creates a recruitment tool. You know, mm -hmm. I've been told time and time again that the effect of the Abu Ghraib pictures and the Guantanamo stories has been to enrage people. And I can articulate that and illustrate that most easily by reference to what happened in Northern Ireland. Britain moved to abusive techniques of interrogation, the five techniques as they were called, for a short period in 1970. Well, they stopped very quickly because it came to be understood 
that the use of new techniques of interrogation of this kind, hooding, stress position, dogs, etc., basically was used as a recruiting tool by the IRA to encourage people who were on the fence to come on board and on their side. And on some accounts, the use of abusive techniques of interrogation, together with internment, together with Bloody Sunday, extended the conflict by between 10 and 15 years in Northern Ireland. And I think we've done exactly the same thing now. Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo will have made it more difficult for us to contain and respond to a real and present threat that we face. This intellectual journey uh, started uh, by you watching a movie, uh, Judgment at Nuremberg, and I went back uh, as part of the preparation, uh, 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 watched the movie, and there's a telling scene at the end where uh, Burt Lancaster, uh, as, as the chief judge on trial in this lawyer trial, uh, uh, has been convicted, and he asked to see Spencer Tracy, who is the the New Hampshire judge who has been presiding and who has found him guilty. And uh, uh, Bert Lancaster tells Spencer Tracy, uh, "Well, I respect you, but I want you to know that I I, I never realized that it would go where it went, uh, that that all these terrible things would happen." And uh, 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 Spencer Tracy tells him, it came to that uh, the first time you sentenced an innocent man, the first time that you crossed the line. And, and I get, uh, we get a, the reader gets a powerful sense from your book that here, in this memo, and you include the log of, of Katani, who was uh, the, the, a major uh, victim, uh, the t detainee who was tortured on the basis of, of this memo, that, that a line was crossed. And, yeah. I mean, there are two ways of looking at it. A line was crossed, and it opened the door to further abuses at Abu Ghraib, I've no doubt. Uh, if you look at the migration of memoranda, the migration of personnel, that the images that emerged at Abu Ghraib a year later are connected to a green light being given to the uh, uh, interrogators by the senior members of the administration to get on with this type of abuse. But there's another way of looking at it. Let's not forget that in the story that I tell, the system in the end worked within the United States. Let's not forget that as the story began to emerge down at Guantanamo that this detainee was being abused, a number of people down at Guantanamo decided they would act and sought out an individual in the Pentagon who they thought could be relied upon to stop this from happening. And he did act. His name's Alberto Mora. He took the matter to Haynes. It took a month, but it stopped down at Guantanamo. There was then another process that was followed, which we don't need to get into now. But it could have been even worse, but for people like Spike Bowman, the FBI lawyer, or Mike Gellis, the Naval Criminal Investigation Service clinical psychologist, or Alberto Mora, the general counsel of the Navy. So I think we need also to recognize that at the end of the day, to a certain extent, perhaps too late, the system did function. Alberto Mora was contacted. He presented his arguments to Jim Haynes. They had an effect. And on the 15th of January 2003, the interrogation abusively of Al-Qahtani stopped. Let's not also forget that three years after that, the Supreme Court acted. A very important judgment. June 2006, not an overwhelming majority, but a significant majority, five votes to three, to determine that the President's decision that no detainees at Guantanamo had any rights under Geneva was wrong as a matter of domestic constitutional law. And that had a catastrophic effect for the administration because it opened the door, as Justice Anthony Kennedy said in his separate opinion in the Hamdan case, to the spectre of war crimes. If it turned out Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions applied, as the Supreme Court ruled it did, throughout this period, then it became clear, as night follows day, that the detainees who were subjected to these techniques of interrogation, whether at Guantanamo or anywhere else, had been the victims of war crimes, which is why the administration pushed through the Military Commissions Act, mm 
which purports to give an immunity against foreign uh, against investigation to any persons involved in the promotion uh, of these techniques of interrogation. So, you know, in a sense, it's a very bad and unhappy story. But in another sense, the system of government in the United States cut in. Mm -hmm. Individuals like Alberta Mora could not be silenced. The Supreme Court could not be silenced. And of course, that is the big difference between then, the time of judgment at Nuremberg, and now. And I think we mustn't forget that. I think it's very important to recall that that could not have happened in the circumstances that gave rise to the acts of lawyers in the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, that doesn't mean we should not be alert, because I think there's every possibility this could happen again. Perhaps it needs one or two more attacks for it to happen again. But the system cut in, uh, and that needs to be stressed. Mm -hmm. One final question. We have only a few minutes left. Brief answer. What, what do you think that President-elect Obama needs to do to walk us back from uh, to this, these, these mistakes to atone in a way that would help restore America's legitimacy? I, I think he's got a very difficult task ahead of him. I, I have a high degree of confidence that if anyone can get it right, it is him. He needs to look forward. He has said that, and I recognize that. But he cannot avoid some looking back. Looking forward, he's already made it clear he is going to shut down Guantanamo. He has to repeal the entirety of the Military Commissions Act and do away with all these military commissions, so-called, uh, and restore some semblance of due process to the system of justice that is to be meted out to various people. And he needs to send out the clearest signals, as he has said he will do, that the United States will not torture anymore. He needs to extend the prohibition on the use of these techniques from the Department of Defense to the CIA, which, of course, President Bush vetoed uh, reasonably recently. And those acts are all acts he can, I, and I think must take, in his first 100 days. If he doesn't do those things, or move to do those things in his first 100 days, I think people will begin to get concerned. I, I think he'll go pretty far pretty quickly. More, more complicated for him is looking back. Mm -hmm. What does he do? in relation to the crimes that have been committed. I don't think he can simply push them under the carpet, and I recognize the limitations in terms of his ability to announce wide-ranging criminal-type investigations. And that's why I think what I've settled on from my perspective is that, at least as a first step, his administration needs to announce within its first 100 days that there will be a far reaching factual investigation, bipartisan, House and Senate, empowered to seek out all of the facts with wide-ranging subpoena powers, personal testimony, all documents, with a view to making recommendations as to what happens next. I think the first step is to sort out the facts and the process of an administration that is not fearful of sorting out the facts, I think will go very, very far in allowing the United States to move to the next stage and help us all move on. Philippi, on that note, I want to thank you for uh, being on our program. Thank you for the book, which I will show again. And uh, uh, I think you've brought a, a real uh, light to uh, things that the U.S. was doing and uh, that many people may not have known we were doing and the people who did know we were doing tried to, uh, tried to stop it. Uh, thank you very much. I recommend the book to our audience and I also suggest that they go watch Judgment at Nuremberg. Harry, uh, thank you this. very much. I've greatly enjoyed being with you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.